we've had so many of you reach out and ask us what we thought about the COVID vaccine, if you're a patient or a survivor. And, you know, we're not doctors here. And so we thought we would reach out to somebody who would be able to answer those questions for us. So today we're speaking with my favorite oncologist. Don't tell my oncologist, but we're speaking to my favorite oncologist who's gonna give us some background about herself and then share her feeling on the COVID vaccine. So there's a lot of people here that maybe haven't seen the original um, chat that you and I had. So if you wouldn't mind, introduce yourself and share a little bit about your background. Sure. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me again. It's always lovely to talk with you all. Uh, so my name is Dr. Rachna Shroff, and I am the section chief of GI medical oncology here at the University of Arizona Cancer Center in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, I am also, I serve as the director of the clinical trials office for the University of Arizona, and uh, we oversee most of the clinical research enterprise for uh, the cancer center. I specifically focus on uh, clinical and translational research in pancreatic and biliary cancers. And I think that this topic related to the COVID vaccine is a very, very relevant one that all of my patients are asking me. So I'm not surprised that you're getting the question. <laughs> I'm sure you've looked at the research. What, what do you see in the research? What is the research telling you? So I would say that there's a couple main take home points. First of all, I really have to applaud the scientists. I, I mean, this is breakneck speed in terms of vaccine development. And it wasn't like they cut corners, which I think is what's really important. And I know what makes a lot of people nervous about how fast the vaccine was developed. This is science at its best. This is understanding the genetic makeup of the COVID-19 virus, taking that, that genetic code, if you will, and creating a, a messenger RNA or mRNA based vaccine to, to one of the most relevant proteins that is found in the, in the virus. So this was not something where it was developed in a way that they jumped over steps to get this to the public. I, you know, this was very systematically done. Uh, when you look at the two main vaccines that are available, but there's still multiple in trial, you can see in the early phase one data, as well as the subsequent uh, phase threes that have now been published in the New England Journal of Medicine, there's a sizable patient population that this was tested in. There were clear safety um, endpoints that they looked at to make sure that this was safe for our patients. And they're continuing to follow them on long-term follow-up. And, you know, I have to say, as somebody who, being a healthcare worker, I've already received my vaccine, there's this amazing program that you sign up for, and they, they're they tracking your symptoms. They, they I get a daily text that is checking in with me to ask me if I felt feverish, if I've had soreness in my arm, if any of these types of symptoms. So you can tell that there is a concerted effort to not only get this to everybody, but to even follow it out beyond the, the published data, which I think just speaks to the scientists recognizing that people are gonna be a little bit weary given how fast it came out. And they just wanna make sure that this is what they think it is, if you will. Um, but I can tell you, I've read both of the New England Journal papers in a lot of detail for the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines. And I read the entire FDA submission, mostly because I, you know, I, I as a scientist, I think I'm a pretty critical thinker and I, I try to critique evidence and make sure that it's really what they're saying it is. Uh, and these are truly effective vaccines. Uh, you know, this is not, oh, one in two people will get some sort of immunity. This is 94, 95% immunity. Um, I think that the effectiveness of the vaccines are clear. I think it is important to get both. Um, and, you know, so that way I'm, I'm hopeful that we are able to ramp up our vaccine deployment so that everyone gets the initial dose as well as the booster dose. Um, there are some vaccines, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is a one-shot um, vaccine. And so we're still waiting to see that data read out and that would obviously be ideal. Uh, but, you know, I think that these are clearly effective in terms of preventing COVID illness. Um, there are questions that we still don't know, and this is why it's so important to continue to mask up and to socially distance and, and to avoid large gatherings because we don't necessarily know what the vaccination, what immunity that you develop, what that does in terms of decreasing your risk of transmitting the virus. So perhaps I could be carrying the virus, not demonstrating symptoms and not feeling sick because I have been vaccinated and I have immunity, but 
could I pass that virus on to somebody else who is not yet protected? Um, and those things, those were just not built into the study. It's not that these are faulty vaccines, they just didn't look at those things. So we don't know yet what we do, what this does to transmission rate. And that's why it's so important, even though I am vaccinated, I am still masking regularly, you know, maintaining my, my social isolation, if you will, working from home, because it's, it's really important to, for, for us to make sure that we, we do our part for public health. I mean, the, the rate at which the vaccines are going, we are not gonna achieve what we call herd immunity, where really it's gonna be safe to resume normal life, whatever we call that now, um, anytime soon. That's all really great information. In your research of uh, the data, were there any cancer patients included in that? No, that's the tricky part. So this was, you know, understandably, when you are developing something fast, you want to make sure you're taking what, what you know, I guess scientists define as the healthiest patients. And so these are people who did not have cancer. They were not uh, excessively young. Um, you know, so were, the cutoff was 16 years of age. Um, they did not take any pregnant patients. So people that could have complicating um, factors were not included. Now, what I will say is that I think now that they've gotten this out to the general population, Moderna, for instance, has just started a, a cohort of patients that are less that are ages 12 to 16. So they're starting to look at that population. Um, and, you know, the uh, American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology have put out their recommendations that patients who are pre pregnant, people who are pregnant should still get this vaccine. There's no, there's nothing that they see in terms of safety signals that would make them worried. And from our perspective, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, ASCO, um, we all put out a, a very strong statement that we, number one, believe that cancer should be a, a, a high risk population that should have early access to the vaccine. And number two, that there should not be any reason to not get the vaccine when and if you're able to. Yeah, you've just touched upon what was gonna be one of my questions. Um, you know, are cancer patients considered at risk? And, and especially the ones that are in current treatment. Right, I, I think so. I think most oncologists, you know, we are worried about that patient population. I mean, I think about my reasons for getting vaccinated. So, you know, and within the healthcare worker population and my reasons were not me. My reasons were my elderly parents and my cancer patients, the people that I see every day that I want to make sure I am not putting at risk. Um, and, you know, I think everybody agrees that in patients who are on active therapy, it's not that they have no immune system, but their immune system, we don't really know how well it functions and what it does in terms of, um, you know, clearing virus and, and re rebounding from some sort of infection. And so we absolutely define it as a, as a high risk population. The COVID-19 Cancer Consortium, which is comprised of a number of um, NCI designated conference of cancer centers that have kind of pulled their data looking at COVID-19, there is a higher mortality rate with cancer patients who get COVID. Um, they've published it now. And so, you know, I, we have, it's not just anecdotal anymore. We have data that shows that patients, that, that patient population should absolutely be in a higher risk category and should, we think, get priority for vaccination. Um, do you think that survivors are considered at risk? That's a great question. And, you know, the, the, the tricky part of that question is how do you define survivor, right? So survivor is somebody who has just undergone a pancreas cancer surgery and has no, no cancer. And there we go. There's a survivor. But then there's also survivors who are 5, 10, 15, 20 years out. So, you know, we still don't know how quickly your immune system reconstitutes, if you will, or kind of revitalizes from chemotherapy, for instance, or other types of treatments that we give. And so survivors, we think, are probably still at a higher risk, but I think it's tiered. I think it's your higher risk the closer you are to receiving active treatments, because it's our treatments that really kind of mess with your immune system. Now, some of that, you know, I will say the caveat to that is patients who have hematologic malignancies, so lymphomas and 
leukemias, which completely alter your immune system. And sometimes even once you do, you know, beat the disease and are a survivor, your immune system never fully recovers. So, you know, there's, there's so many grays, there's so many shades of gray there. Uh, but by and large, we think of them as a higher risk patient population. Again, um, I just don't know what we're, what we would, what we would cut as our criteria in terms of time cutoff of when your risk drops, if you will, or, or is relative to the general population. Have you had any patients with COVID? I have. Uh, unfortunately, Arizona is, you know, a hot spot right now. Um, we we made it into the New York Times for the wrong reasons, having the highest per capita rate of COVID. Um, and unfortunately, I have a lot of patients who have who have had COVID. Um, thankfully, so far, knock on wood, um, they've all recovered. Uh, but you know, uh, sadly, my my nurse and I are every week we're getting calls um, of patients who have to delay their chemo because they're COVID positive and. And that, and actually, even more frightening was we've had colleagues, you know, my my surgeons who I work elbow to elbow with, who were in the ICU, um, you know, fighting for their life. Uh, it's been this this recent surge to me has been the most chilling because um, it's felt the closest to home. It's a lot of people that I know and patients who I care about who are being affected, and it's um, it's really really hard. Do you have? any concern that some of the new variants, like the new UK variant that is showing up, do you have any concern about what that's going to do to the existing vaccines? Are they, are they going to become uh, irrelevant? Uh, I mean, say something about that. I think the implications of the variants is really going to be related to infection spread and transmission. Um, they have done some tests specifically to the UK variant, and at least Moderna has put out data that shows that their vaccine is effective against it. Um, and you know the the variants themselves, they're, they're what we call kind of single nucleotide polymorphisms. There's just a very small change in the genetic code, which should not dramatically alter the spike protein genetic code, which is what these vaccines are based on. So my hope is is that no time soon <laughs> will these will these variants impact the the ability for us to get everybody immunized. Um, I think over time, we're going to have to get more creative and, and more strategic about how, what, what this looks like in, in the long game. Um, you know, this is our short term solution. But, you know, even my, my 12 year old daughter yesterday was, well, mommy, there's genetic drift and there's going to be changes in, these, in this genetic code. And, and then she's right. You know, I mean, that's what we've seen with flu. And that's why there's an annual flu shot. And that's what we saw with the H1N1 outbreak and things like that. So this, I think, unfortunately, COVID is going to be part of our lives. It's just a question of, can we keep it sequestered in the way that we've been able to get a hold of like influenza? Do you think that the COVID vaccine is going to be like the flu vaccine in that, that you will get one annually? I don't know about the, the frequency, but I do think it is something that we're going to probably have. It's not going to be a, a one and done, you know, like polio or, or, you know, some of the other vaccines that you get early on in life. Um, I, I, I have a feeling just because we've already seen mutations and variations emerge, um, I have a feeling that we're going to probably need, some, need these vaccinations on a routine basis. I just don't know what routine means yet. Right. Yeah, no, that makes sense. You know, what's your thought about patients getting the vaccine? And maybe you don't have this, but I've got you here, so I'm going to ask you anyways. What is your thought on patients that have pre-existing autoimmune disorders? getting a vaccine? You know, my general answer to every patient right now is I, I say, get it as soon as you can. And acknowledge the fact that if you're on active chemotherapy, perhaps your immune response won't be the same. If you have an autoimmune condition that affects how your immune system works, perhaps your immune response won't be the same. But I definitely don't think that we've seen anything in the data that suggests that, that puts these patients at risk. So to me, you can only win from it and you should not lose anything from getting it. Um, and that's what I say to my patients about the flu shot. I mean, I, you know, patients every year ask me that, you know, should I get my flu shot? And, I'm, I, and I say, absolutely, because it can only help you and I don't think it can hurt you. Um, you know, I will say, I, I know I mentioned this to you offline that we are we're asking this exact question right now at the University of Arizona, because we think it's an important question to understand what the immune response looks like in cancer patients who are getting this vaccine. So we literally just opened a study to basically follow patients 
a healthy cohort, so patients who do not have a history of cancer or who are not on active therapy, and follow patients who are on active chemotherapy or you know some sort of treatment that affects their immune system. And then we're basically drawing blood and following their T cell response and their antibody developments, um, it, basically on the days of the vaccine, so the first dose, the second dose, and then seven days after the second dose, which is when the Moderna and Pfizer data shows that you start to develop that immune response or that you really have a robust immune response. Um, so that way, hopefully we'll get a sense of what, what the immune response in a cancer patient on active treatment looks like. Are there, in your mind, any exceptions of people that shouldn't get the vaccine right now? You know, I think there are, I mean, there's a lot of um, concern, <coughs> concern related to the, um, the allergic reactions that, that are being talked about. You know, there was some suggestion that people with shellfish allergy should be, uh, you know, should take caution. But I have to be honest, I mean, my cousin, for instance, she's a physician and she has a selfish allergy and she did fine. So, um, and then the other one is polyethylene glycol allergies, patients who have an, an allergy to polyethylene glycol. My husband's an allergist, so we talk about this at home a lot. Um, and so for those people, my understanding is, is what he has been recommending to his allergy patients is, is to just you know, make sure you, if you want to receive it, make sure you have an epinephrine pen and, you know, they're considering doing desensitizations and things like that. But outside of that, I, I really, I, there are very few people that I can think of, I guess, other than children, since we don't know what it does yet in children, um, that I would say should not be getting it. Are there any ingredients that concern you? And the one that I have been looking up is PEG 3000. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you've already spoken to that. Is, are there any other ingredients that concern you? No, not that I've seen. And like I said, you know, because my husband's been really intrigued by these allergic reactions, we, he's kind of looked at, at at the whole, you know, composition basically of these vaccines. And I don't think so. I think there are, you know, there are complexities to both of these vaccines. Like, you know, everyone talks about the, um, the uh, temperature for storage that's required for the Pfizer vaccine. And so there's, you know, logistics or, and distribution uh, complexities and things like that. But outside of that, I don't think that there's anything that has made me take pause or raise my eyebrows. We've covered a lot of ground in a short amount of time. Is there anything else that you'd like to leave our community with or any kind of advice? Uh, I, I think the most salient piece of advice that I would give is, is that when you are able to get this vaccine, please get it. Um, you know, I really, I feel very strongly that our, our cancer patient population is such a special population. and. Uh, you know, I get why they weren't included in the studies, but I don't think that that means that they should not be given access to the vaccine. And like I said, I mean, I think they should be given priority access. Um, so I, I think it's, that's the most important takeaway to me is getting, getting the vaccine, getting both doses, uh, but then continuing our, you know, COVID mitigation, as we call it with the social distancing and the, you know, the masking and all of the other things. Um, I think we're, I think, we're in it for a while. So I don't, I don't think that's going away anytime soon, but you know, I think the vaccination is one step, one huge step forward. That leads me to another question. Um, what about the people that don't get the second vaccine? Is there any data on that? So when you look at the data that was published on both the Moderna and Pfizer, it's around 50%, they think, in terms of efficacy of you know, risk of, of COVID. But what I will say is when you actually look at the way that the studies were designed, they weren't really designed to look at an endpoint of, I got one dose and what is my risk of COVID? So I don't know how statistically significant or really relevant that is in the patient population. I mean, we know that it's probably not 95% risk of, of uh, risk reduction or 95% you know, uh, effective, uh, but I, I think it's probably better than 50%. Uh, you know, I've been on a lot of, I'm in a lot of um, COVID physician social media groups and people have been doing some of the at-home antibody testing and things as they've gotten the vaccine. And people are seeing antibodies as early as seven days after the first shot. So clearly your immune system is starting to work right after that first shot. I just don't know exactly what percentage that translates to. So in my opinion is, God forbid, you can't get the second one. One is still better than zero. Well, and that's even um, statistically better than some of the flu vaccines that have come out over the years. So 50% would be awesome. Certainly better than 0%. 
Exactly. So uh, it's always so wonderful to speak with you. And I'm so grateful you took the time out of your schedule. I know how busy you are. And I know the community is going to love this because you're just so open and, and so easy to speak with. So I just want to thank you again for joining us because I really felt like this was uh, relevant information that needed to be disseminated out to our community because they've been asking about it so much. So again, thank you very much. Of course. Thank you so much for having me.